Hi, my name is Liz Dalton, and I'm the treasurer of the Clinical Psychology at Liberal Arts College's campus group of the ABCT. Um, and we're thrilled today to be able to present this webinar to all of you on illuminating the academic um, liberal arts path and, and have our, our esteemed speakers with us uh, this afternoon. So I'll first just allow each of the speakers to introduce themselves, and then I'll provide an overview of <coughs> this webinar for this afternoon. Um, Dr. Wang, do you want to start us off? Sure, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shu Wen Wang. I am a recently tenured um, associate professor at Haverford College. Um, I received my PhD in clinical psychology from UCLA. I um, had gone to Barnard College, um, a liberal arts college for women um, affiliated with Columbia University for my own undergrad. Um, went to UCLA um, 2006 to 2012 and then started right at Haverford right after that in an assistant professor position. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lindner, do you want to go next? Uh-oh. Oh. <laughs> Can you hear me? Looks like it's frozen. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Fort, do you want to go while we're... <laughs> sure. To no use? problem. <laughs> No problem. My name is Dr. Kristen Fort, and I originally attended Wheaton College for my BA in psychology. Uh, I went on to Fuller Graduate School of Psychology, which is housed in a seminary out in California, where I received a PhD in clinical psychology and a Master of Arts in theology. And I mentioned both because a lot of what I do is integrative work between both disciplines. I am now an assistant professor actually at Wheaton College, my alma mater, which is an intriguing experience and also a meaningful one. Uh, I am also in part-time practice as a clinical psychologist as well. Um, and yeah, I enjoy, enjoy the work. Great, wonderful, thank you. Um, and we also have Dr. Danielle Lindner who is joining us from Stetson University. Uh, looks like she might be temporarily experiencing some technical difficulties. Um, so so I'm actually here. I'm oh, back. You're here. I don't, all of a sudden, my, my internet went away. Um, so I apologize. I am back um, very quickly. Um, so my name is uh, Dr. Danielle Lindner. I'm an assistant professor of psychology at Stetson University in Deland, Florida, um, which is outside of Orlando. I am starting my sixth year. So I actually just am at the very beginning of the tenure and promotion process. Uh, I completed my undergraduate work at Nazareth College in Rochester, New York, and then went to the University of Central Florida um, and did my clinical internship at James A. Haley VA in Tampa, and then started my faculty position right after graduation. Awesome. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so just to provide an, an overview of what we're going to uh, talk through this afternoon, so we'll devote about the first to allowing uh, the speakers to address various questions and prompts that kind of allow them to describe what it's like to work at a small liberal arts college. In the next half hour, we'll kind of transition to discussing points about preparing to get a position at a small liberal arts college. And then finally, we'll have the final half hour uh, devoted to a session. Uh, on the bottom of your viewing screen, you should see a, an option for Q&A, so you can type out questions that way. And we also have some questions that people submitted in advance of today's presentation. So that's sort of the, the overview. Um, so to start us off, to kind of talk about, you know, what it's like to work at a small liberal arts college, uh, we were hoping that each panelist might provide a, a brief description of kind of what their day-to-day -day looks like. So we can proceed in the same order, or you can vary the order if you prefer. Do you want to start us off, Dr. Wang, if you don't mind? <laughs> um, so I am um, at Haverford College, a um, small liberal arts college um, that's also, you know, very much prioritizes and supports research. And so I'll say that my teaching load, um, I teach either two courses a semester or one and a half courses um, another semester. The half course I teach is a non-traditional practicum course uh, where, you know, students are in placements throughout the community, and so that's not really a full course of teaching for me. So mm -hmm. we have one full course and maybe the practicum course, or I'll have two courses in any given semester. And the rest of the time is, you know, there's, there's um, some service work, there is, um, you know, which means, you know, sitting on committees and, mm -hmm. 
think we all know the more competent and the more um, you know, respected you are, the more you get kind of pulled onto increasingly more and more different kinds of service commitments. And service is part of, uh, part of what it means to be um, a good citizen um, at any institution, but I think particularly so at um, small liberal arts co colleges. Um, and then I also have a private practice. Um, I'm part of a group private practice, um, and I spend my Fridays there. Um, so today, that's where I came from just now. Um, and so depending on the day of the week, um, I might be preparing for a couple of lectures. Right now at my point in my career, um, all of that will change next year when I have an, a new course, but um, I don't have any new course preps right now, which really changes things. I'm really spending um, you know, some quick time um, just reviewing my lectures, uh, making sure I'm prepared for that day, um, making sure that if there's any adjustments, if there's a new article I want to add, and if there's new research I want to add in, a new activity I want to add in, that might take a little bit more time, but I'm spending maybe, you know, 30 minutes, um, you know, preparing for each lecture. Um, and then I take meetings with students, of course. I have honors thesis students, or not even on them. We have thesis students. Every student here completes a thesis, mm -hmm. um, uh, oftentimes an empirical project that takes an entire year. And so there's a lot of advising around that. Um, and then um, I have uh, research meetings with research assistants, um, research meetings with collaborators. And so a typical day is any combination um, of all of those things and potentially um, service meeting, um, some kind of committee. That's awesome. I can go next if we're going in that, that order. Um, so again, I'm Dr. Kristen Fortz and I am an assistant professor at Wheaton College. And I, uh, similarly to Dr. Wang, uh, have varying days, kind of depending, um, my days look different depending on what the setup is for that day. So uh, I am at the college four days a week as well. Um, and then I see clients for about 12 to 16 hours a week. So that winds up being about a day and a half. So I spend all day on Thursday at the clinic, um, all day only being eight to five though, as opposed to the all, all day. And uh, so I see my evening clients on Wednesday nights. Um, so Mondays are typically all academic day. So we have our department meetings and um, some of our department meetings. Um, and I do office hours with students and I am in my second year of teaching in a tenure track position. So I definitely am still prepping for classes more uh, than Dr. Wang has described with the 30 minutes. I look forward to the 30 minute prep when I get there. Um, uh, last year that looked like about three hours of preparation before, um, yeah, before all my lectures, which was exhausting, but also meaningful. Um, and uh, this time around, I don't have any new preps, so I'm down to about I think I'm 45 minutes in an hour. Um, every once in a while I have a class where it's only 10 minutes of prep, and that's beautiful to review that all three hours last semester was worth it. Um, so um, that happens there. Meeting with students who are in the undergrad program here at the Liberal Arts College where I am working. But I also work at a school that has a graduate school of psychology as well with two master's programs and a doctorate program. I've recently uh, renegotiated my position to have the freedom to work with doctoral students and master's students as well. Um, so I have some release time. Uh, speaking to that point that Dr. Wang mentioned earlier, this is a teaching institution, as we actually have a 3-3. Three, three. Um, so I have some release time, so I have a two and a half or two, a three, um, or two, two eventually is the goal, um, leaving more room for advising with doctoral students, which I do do. So Tuesdays are a research day for me where I'm working on my own research. Um, last year I was also teaching that day, but after renegotiating, I'm not teaching on Tuesdays. Um, and I will meet with my doctoral students during our lab meeting time and schedule other meetings, do my own research as well. Um, and I've already mentioned Thursdays are the clinical day, Wednesday nights are clinical nights. So it all varies, kind of depending on the day, what's happening. Yeah. Um, well, again, I apologize. I don't know what exactly is happening with our internet connection on campus at the moment, but I appear to be situated again. Um, so Stetson is also primarily a teaching institution. Um, we have a 3-3 course load here. And um, while we have a master's program in mental health counseling, that's entirely separate from what happens in the Department of Psychology. So all of my work is with our undergraduate students, um, teaching and mentoring and doing research. Um, and then of course, um, as Dr. Wang mentioned, service. Um, so right now, um, I would say there's sort of a typical Monday, Wednesday, Friday for me, and then a typical Tuesday, Thursday. Um, I have my classes stacked on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, in large part because I am not yet licensed as a psychologist. And so on those Tuesday, Thursdays, 
um, through an agreement with our counseling center, uh, after we hired a psychologist, I actually began seeing clients there to get hours for licensure. So my Tuesday and Thursday afternoons are clinical work. And um, my Monday, Wednesday, Friday um, includes teaching uh, both clinically oriented courses and then also um, we require all of our students to do an independent senior research project and that takes place over two semesters. And so um, much of my teaching load every semester is devoted to either teaching that research methods course um, where the students also develop their proposal or supervising students as they're completing their projects. Um, I also just find that I spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with students, um, whether it's talking about classes or talking about professional development issues or, or even just like yesterday, a student came in to tell me about a study that she read that she thought was really interesting. Um, and it was kind of spurring some thoughts uh, in her about other classes um, and ways that she might apply that to her senior research. So. Um, there's a lot of time, face time with students between the, the teaching um, and the research mentorship. I do also have my own research lab. Um, I study body image and disordered eating, and so I have a small group of undergraduate students who work with me. Uh, but as you might expect, you know, having a 3-3 load um, and working primarily with undergraduate students um, as opposed to kind of a different mixture, um, my focus really is on teaching and mentoring those students and um, my research um, tends to take a little less time during the week. I would say it's a really good week if I have about half a day to really do a deep dive on my own research. Great, thank you. Uh, next, we were hoping that you could each speak to perhaps your favorite part and least favorite part of working at a small liberal arts college. Shall we go in a different order this time? We could. Um, I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, go for it. Yeah, so my favorite part, hands down, is my students. Um, that is the reason I chose this career path. Um, I developed a really close relationship with my own undergraduate advisor. She was really the person who um, got me involved in research in the first place and then really has mentored me throughout my entire career. We still talk regularly. Um, so hands down, it's the work that I do with students. Um, I would say my least favorite part of my job at present is um, is some of the kind of administrivia. And I don't mean that as a criticism of my current <laughs> administration. Um, I just think that, you know, there's such an emphasis right now on um, assessment, like I'm our department's assessment coordinator. So I handle our assessment of whether we're meeting our learning outcomes. And I think being accountable about all those things is really important. But if I'm asked to write like a 12 page report, um, <laughs> that takes time away from my students or my research. So I, I would much rather like have that stuff happen in a briefer um, forum. But I'm getting to the place in my career where I can be more vocal about those things and make some recommendations. So um, so hopefully we'll we'll see some changes. I'm also getting more efficient, so that yeah. helps too. <laughs> um, Dr. Wang, do you want to go next? Sure, sure. Next up. Well, I, I would echo you know everything that Dr. Lindner said. I think that um, I, I love my students. I love the integration of of research and teaching together. I think that that's really unique about being in settings like ours, um, mm -hmm. where um, you know teaching and research aren't separate things, but part of advising a senior thesis is working collaboratively with students. And we have just, we have incredible students. And so it's been a pleasure for me. Um, teaching doesn't feel onerous because we have small classes um, and teaching doesn't look necessarily like this traditional lecture form. You get to do things that are really dynamic, really interactive and engaging. Um, I just came out of a class yesterday where the activity was a cultural simulation activity that we did. I teach a class called cultural psychology, which is a upper level lecture course for us over here, 35 students. And so that affords me the opportunity to do things like creating a cultural simulation and then having having the assignment be a written paper in response to that, using theory and research from class to analyze what happened. And so I get to do things like that that I don't think would be possible at um, other kinds of institutions. And, and that's what I really, really love about this kind of work is that there's a lot of integration between my own personal interests, my research, um, also with the um, with students and advising and teaching. It kind of feels really organic and holistic to me. Um, 
you know, it's the, um, you know, Dr. Linder, I think he uses the word at administ, um, and yeah, it's it's good, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, that, that's a great word. <laughs> so <laughs> also, there is, I think sometimes in smaller settings where a single person can actually make a really, really big difference and have a lot of impact. I think there's a lot more collective responsibility for how things work and, and you know, oversight of functions and processes. And that can be a very, um, that can be a very, um, um, you know, you know, exhilarating thing if you really enjoy that. It can also feel very draining at times and make you feel like you're being pulled uh, away from things that are personally more relevant and important. Um, it's also really great training for folks who are interested in a position um, kind of more in administration. Um, but I think that mm -hmm. for me, I've, I found that to be a negative at times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would echo a lot of what has been said already as well. Um, I love integration, integration of disciplines. I do a lot of cross-disciplinary work between the disciplines of psychology broadly, but clinical psychology specifically, and theology, or religiosity and spirituality. And I love diving into those disciplines and not just kind of adding on. Um, so that makes me really excited. But I also love collaboration in general. It's one of the things I'm most excited about in my position in a liberal arts college. It's part of why I've not taken other positions that I've had the opportunity to take, is that I can actually dive dive in deeply, but also have collaborators that are really close at hand um, who are in other disciplines for me, like philosophers or theologians um, or practicing clinicians who might be nearby that I can work with in a collaborative way. Um, so I love just diversity in what I do. That's part of why I'm enjoying practicing and researching and teaching. Um, a challenging side of that in the liberal arts space, especially um, is resources and funding. And so I do have access to resources. I love the resources that I have, and I know there's more access that I'm still learning about as I'm entering the second year. Um, but at the same time, I know that if I was somewhere else that the, the financial resources or even like the um, human labor, human capital, I um, have a little bit more research assistance or those kinds of things that might be uh, more available to me. And so, um, yeah, counting those costs and also figuring out, like Dr. Lindner said, how to be more efficient with that time and how to direct the research advisees that I do have a couple of doctoral students I'm working with right now on how to help us all be more efficient, but also enjoy the time um, that we have to dive in. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so next, uh, some of you have already touched on this a little bit, but hoping you can give a little more insight into the relative time that you dedicate um, to teaching, research, service, and then other, <laughs> which might include clinical practice or you know life outside of uh, your job as well. I can go first if that's helpful. Um, we'll keep mixing it up. Um, so in terms of teaching right now, um, we're in the fourth week of this semester, so I'm getting into my rhythm a little bit more this time around. Um, I probably put in about 14 or 15 hours directed towards teaching at this point. Um, that probably, as grading uh, increases throughout the semester, probably increases to about 15 to 20 hours for me in all teaching related activities. That does not include meeting with students or other things. That's partially because I give really um, long assignments. Um, and so there's lots of questions around pedagogy and what's most helpful for students, what's most helpful for me as a professor, but there's a, a good amount of time. I think half the week is spent um, total in grading and writing exams. Writing exams, by the way, takes a long time. I discovered if you're not drawing from a bank. Mm -hmm. um, my first exam I wrote took five hours to write it. And I was like, is this, is this how it's supposed to be? Um, so lots of processing there. Um, so about 20 hours a week total with grading and teaching um, that includes lectures and lecture preps and the grading. Um, and then I probably spend about uh, about 16 hours a week doing clinical work right now. Um, that includes administrative paperwork, that includes consultations with psychiatrists that I'm calling or calling back, and that includes actually seeing my clients. Um, there's lots of administrative work on the clinical side of things for me because I went from being full-time at my site um, during my postdoc year to being part-time now that I'm in a tenure-track faculty position, but I didn't drop a lot of my clients. Several asked to go down to every other week or once a month, which means there's more people that are being managed, so scheduling has taken up more time than it might have if there was a regular rhythm of just being in a full-time position only. Um, and in terms of advising and research, I would say, generally speaking, that takes probably about probably eight to 10 hours a week, or at least fully when I'm diving into is what it looks like. Um, thinking back to what Dr. Linder said earlier, um, a good day would be if I had a full half day just diving into my own work. 
But as I'm diving into the projects of my students, my doctoral students in particular, there's some familiarity that I'm gaining with um, some of the literature that it was not my particular area of expertise that drew them in. Um, so that just is taking more time on this end. And because I'm a second year as well, and because I'm primarily in the undergrad department, I find myself having to take time for um, coffee and office um, collaborations with other uh, more advanced faculty here to ask who are in the doctoral program, what are you doing? So lots of additional meetings that I wouldn't have planned for because that's actually not my department in the SID program, um, but I'm working with those students need to know kind of the requirements on that end too. Um, so research, clinical work, um, teaching, and then service, uh, that probably right now is pretty limited for me. I happen to have a dean who is really, very truly trying to shepherd the time of pre-tenured faculty, and so she's requested that we do not join any committees, committees outside of our um, school, the School of Psychology, um, which has been really intriguing for me. I happen to be a person who likes to be involved in committees, and so that's been a, a good discipline to say no to those invitations. Um, and to dive into the, the smaller committee work that we have here right now. So that probably only takes one or two hours a week on my end. So. Yeah. Um, it's, I, I was trying to think, um, uh, Dr. Fort, as you were talking about exact hours I spend, um, that's kind of hard for me to quantify. So I'm gonna kind of roll with um, maybe percentages of my time or try to, I guess. I don't know, some mixture of that. Um, <laughs> So I'm um, at a, a teaching institution where, you know, our load is 3-3. Three, three. Um, I'm definitely spending at least half of my time in um, course or course-related activities, whether it's prepping materials, um, doing kind of the administrative side of teaching, which is something I, I just didn't really think about when I started <laughs> my job, like responding to student emails. Um, yeah, so so much time on email. Um, grading work, um, I too tend to give longer assignments and tend to be pretty extensive with my feedback. Mm -hmm. um, so it's at least half my time on teaching and teaching related activities. Um, then right now I would say um, clinical work is probably realistically only about 10% of my time. Um, I see six to eight clients a week and I don't have to like commute somewhere else. I'm right on campus. A uh, couple hours of supervision, a few hours for documentation. It's probably 10 to 15% of my time. Um, then service activities, I would say, um, probably look like, keeping track of my math here, um, probably another 10 to 15 percent, depending. Um, I too like to be involved in, in committees and in our campus community. And um, I also find that um, just, I think by virtue of the, the type of research that I do, students frequently, frequently want me to present at things. Um, I collaborate a lot with residential life, residential living mm -hmm. and learning. So, um, you know, planning, programming, um, I've participated on a lot of search committees externally. Um, so about ten, another 10 to 15% service and like somewhere between 15 and 20% research. Sometimes that's my research. Sometimes it, it's student projects. And that I think speaks to that integration of teaching and research is, you know, sometimes I'm working on a research project and something that maybe originated more with a student um, but is something that that has kind of grown and, and I'm actually getting something that's going to count in terms of my own scholarly productivity, mm -hmm. um, which matters when you're in a tenure track position. Yes, it does. Yeah, I'll speak about percentages as well. I'm also throwing out there, I have three small kids. Um, I had one child in graduate school, had two other kids all in quick succession. They're all two years apart. Mm -hmm. um, had two other children um, when I um, started, after starting the tenure track. I actually had my, my second child um, two weeks after flying in um, and landing here right outside of Philadelphia uh, to start my job. And so um, um, family is really important to me and just part of the fabric of my, my daily life. I also um, am, um, ha, you know, have a partner who is um, also works in a very demanding job. And so, um, you know, we're both kind of very driven in our careers, but also very devoted to family. And so for me, I work a lot of split shifts in some ways. I go home, I go home early. Uh, my colleagues here all know that and are fairly supportive of that. Um, I go home um, 2.45, 
Monday, Wednesdays, and, and Fridays, uh, mm -hmm. typically to um, be with the kids, help them get to activities, and kind of start our home life. Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm here, you know, until 5.30 or 6. Um, so I'll say that at the outset. And so I do, I, I do do a lot of my work at night, not as much anymore as before when I was earlier on in my career. But, um, you know, but certainly there's a lot of kind of split time. Mm -hmm. That's a very real part of my life. Um, and so when I think about percentages of, of time, I was like scribbling this down as I was uh, listening to you both talk. I was like, yeah, really, how much time do I spend on everything? I would say right now I spend um, anywhere between 15 to 20% of my time on clinical work per week. Um, to me, that looks anywhere something like four hours to, to seven hours of, of, of direct uh, patient time. Um, I probably spend a about 30 to 40 percent on teaching and teaching related activities simply depending on the moment of the the moment of the um the semester that we're in um that also includes I mean, i do consider my students research as part of teaching related although of course it straddles all of these different categories but i would say about you know 30 percent typically maybe up to 40 percent during high stress points of the semester um, about 25 to 30 percent on research and ideally i would like that time to be higher um, at this point in my career um, it's probably not as much time as it was before, um, it, and I'm trying to get that back up again. And that's largely because I'm sitting on more uh, committees now. I was actually elected to be uh, the junior faculty representative for the college, and that was an elected position that lasted a couple of years, took a lot of time, um, and was a was a was a great experience and something that was a, a great in investment of time. But that time does come away from somewhere. Um, and also other, I've sat on, I'm currently sitting on my third search um, for a tenure track position. And so I've sat on two prior tenure track searches for psychology positions. Um, and I'm on my third search for uh, health studies, which is related to my area. Um, and so lastly, you know, service anywhere 10 to 15%, just depending on the time of, you know, what's, what's being, you know, asked. Um, I will say that um, I think that service um, for all of us in academia, it, it really is, I think, um, it's not a completely random thing. There are some folks who are engaged in more service because they enjoy it, um, because mm -hmm. other people think that they're great at it, and so then you get asked more um, because there's a certain need. I think that as someone who is um, one of fewer um, faculty of color at my institution, that is slowly changing. Mm -hmm. um, but I've also, you know, been called upon for my perspective and uh, my perspective as an Asian American woman um, has been mm -hmm. something that I think has really added a lot to conversations on campus. And so mm -hmm. I felt some personal responsibility to, to, those, um, to those obligations and to the ways in which I can better my institution. And so that's something that has been part of, you know, part of the package. And so, um, you know, that would be my rough approximation of time. Great. Thank you all. Um, so the next question is, what are your expectations for research, um, both in terms of possibly number of publications or rough number of publications that are indicated uh, for tenure? And are there expectations for external grant funding? And, and if so, what are those like? Um, I could probably speak to that. I, I just did my tenure and promotion portfolio, so I've got this down. Um, so I'll get it started. Um, so our standards for tenure and promotion um, in the area of research, as in our other areas, are articulated really clearly. And um, I think this varies widely across institution types. So, um, you know, I want to kind of keep that in mind. Um, one of our standards is consistency. And so here, what that typically looks like is one form of scholarly output every year, but that doesn't have to be a publication. Um, and, and that our standards are written that way, I think, to recognize the fact that sometimes it takes a while to get something published. Um, and sometimes there are just other venues through which we might uh, uh, share our scholarly work. So um, some form of scholarly product every year and um, a minimum of two peer-reviewed publications for tenure and promotion. Now, as someone coming out of an R1 environment for graduate school, um, you know, two publications a year um, wasn't, wasn't a big deal. Um, I wound up, I had um, four, four peer-reviewed publications, I think 14 conference presentations. A lot of those were with students. Um, and I have several papers under review right now. I'm at a stage um, where I was culminating a lot of projects. So, so that's kind of what productivity looks like, at least at this institution. 
Oh, uh, and also no, no clear expectations for external funding. Um, they would like for us to be doing that. I think um, here at Stetson, they're still figuring out how best to support faculty in doing that and in having research programs that are as active as mine and, and those of some of my other colleagues. Sure, I'll, uh, and I'll, I'll follow on that. And so um, I'm looking at my math. I received tenure. Um, I, I put in my, my, my dossier, my packet um, last time around this year, uh, last year around this time. Um, received the decision this last May, and so I very recently went through that review process. Um, here at Haverford, um, we don't actually have exact numbers. Um, the, the general guidelines that we have is that we have to be um, research active, really engaged, you have to have some kind of profile um, within your field, and there's you know evidence of that through different uh, you know different indicators, being asked to review, sitting on a, having some kind of editorial position, um, um, standings in conferences, and um, you know presenting and everything, but, um, but, but we, you know, I would say that my rough guideline from having spoken with people informally here was um, to be publishing at least one to two uh, publications per year. Um, so it is something that is that is important here at Haverford. We all have resources. I came in with a very gen, uh, very generous startup, a very competitive startup. Um, I had friends at research institutions who were really taken aback by the kind of research support I received when first starting out here at Haverford, and also that I continue to receive. Um, I have lab space. I you know, we're in a recently got renovated building where I got to design my own lab space. Um, you know, our, so, so there's a lot of support and therefore um, the expectations for tenure, I think are consistent with that. Um, they don't feel overwhelming to me. It's, it's perfectly manageable where I am. So um, for example, when I got the position, I'd had um, 11 peer reviewed publications I'm oh, sorry, 13 peer reviewed publications and five book chapters. That is, um, I think, speaks to largely attending UCLA and having the resources and support of an institution like UCLA. And so that's not mm -hmm. typical for students. Um, nothing specific about me, simply about the background. And then since I've been here at Haverford, I've published 11, during the time coming up for tenure, I had 11 peer reviewed publications and two book chapters. And so I think those are just some quantitative data for what, um, what it took to get tenure here. Mm -hmm. So helpful to hear those numbers. I think that's something that I would have loved to hear kind of across the liberal arts span. So I love that we're doing this for those who are interested moving forward. Um, I am at an institution where we have not quantified numbers quite the same way that uh, Dr. Wang or Dr. Linder have described. Um, we do have a recommendation, a strong recommendation that there uh, is scholarly product or scholarly publication like we were discussing earlier, a couple of those per year. So that can include both conference presentations and also peer reviewed articles. Um, so somewhere between two and three of those every year should be coming out, but it, that's two conference presentations and there's going to be one peer reviewed um, book chapter or peer reviewed article. Um, and obviously those are different, right? Book chapters and articles and empirical research can all all kind of different. Um, so there's a little bit more variety um, and that's both helpful in terms of kind of depending on how you do your work but also can be challenging and a bit confusing with lots of conversations um, just in general um, around kind of what exactly is the number that you need to have and there is no set number. Um, there's lots of the dialogue among our community because we come from such different disciplines um, of can there be a set number and what do we do about disciplinary differences in that regard. Um, I'm encouraged by the fact that as a clinical psychologist that there is room both for empirical, theoretical, and clinical research. Um, there is an expectation though that a fair amount of the work is empirical, even if it is clinical, if it is empirical, even if it is um, that empirical complements the theoretical work. So there's a range of types of publications that can come out. That uh, freedom to publish different types of work is helpful for me, especially because it's a type of interdisciplinary work that I do. Um, but there is the expectation that there is, um, yeah, ongoing, very active research presence that's continued. And ideally, to some degree with students, because it's a liberal arts institution, with undergrad students specifically, I mean. Um, one of the benefits for me in working with some of the grad students is to be doing some of a different type of work um, or a different level of work um, with the students that can be beneficial to my tenure packet and hopefully very beneficial to my doctoral students as well. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit more um, of a nebulous cloud around some of that, but definitely an expectation of consistent product every year um, with more than one piece of something that's scholarly. Mm -hmm. 
Something I might jump in and add um, that I think sounds like it's something that's been part of Dr. Ford and Dr. Linder's experiences as well is that um, I do think that the tenure consideration here at Haverford, at least in my experience, has been a very holistic one. And so people aren't saying how much, you know, there's no expectation for me to bring in grants, you know, per se um, for my field. Now, if I were a behavioral neuroscientist, that would be different, mm -hmm. um, regardless of setting, right? But, um, but there isn't um, the idea that you have to get a grant for the sake of getting a grant. Um, mm -hmm. For me here, it's really the, um, the whole experience has actually been a very kind of, let's see what, what does this person bring to the institution as a package and what is mm -hmm. um, narrative consistency in terms of the research that this person mm -hmm. does coupled with their teaching and their activity on campus in terms of advising and being on committees and service. Um, what does this person bring overall? And so I think that, you know, some relative weakness in some areas can be shored up by relative strengths in other areas. Um, research is, you know, part of that for me here um, in a very strong way, um, but it's also something where, you know, we're more interested in like, the quality of the research as opposed to necessarily quantity of publications. Great. Thank you all so much. Um, so I think we'll transition now to some questions geared more towards uh, preparing to get a position such as this and then perhaps come back to some other questions during the Q&A. Uh, so to start off with, we might have some people listening who are currently graduate students who might be interested in liberal arts college jobs. Uh, and so the question is, do you have particular recommendations for people who might be in that position to help make them competitive for this type of position? Mm -hmm. um, having, so uh, we conducted a lot of searches here. We had a, a lot of um, people retire or move to other positions all at once. So having um, I, I've been on three search committees and actually um, just before this webinar joined a fourth. Um, so for us, when we are looking at candidates, we want to see clear evidence of teaching experience. And um, at, the, at the graduate level, I think, you know, certainly you're often functioning as an instructor of record or, um, or a teaching assistant, but in my program, sometimes there was emphasis on research assistantships or other clinical placements over the teaching. And so um, from, I knew from the get-go that I wanted this type of a position. And so um, for me, it was having really candid conversations with my graduate advisor, who was thankfully so supportive of my desire to move into this type of role. Um, and then she and I really thinking through, okay, so, so as I was funding the rest of my graduate training, what makes the most sense? So we sought out a lot of um, different teaching experiences for me. I supervised our undergraduate fieldwork program and taught that course independently for a number of years. So um, having extra teaching experiences above and beyond kind of what's minimally required and maybe strategizing sometimes teaching over research and clinical work um, it really helped me to make me competitive in that area. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, I had in some ways the good fortune that my graduate advisor was transitioning into a different role at the university and so she wasn't taking graduate students anymore and our research lab really changed and I was able to through that demonstrate my own ability to manage research independently um, and begin to develop a scholarly program. And so, um, you know, when I was applying for jobs, her sort of endorsement of me was, I know she can do this work because she's already done it. Mm -hmm. um, so while I wouldn't wish someone's lab kind of falling apart on them, um, I think to the extent that you can find ways to demonstrate that you have the ability to have your own research program or start to craft that. Um, supervising undergraduate students as a graduate student, like getting involved in honors theses or mentoring research assistants, being your lab manager, all of those things are going to speak to what can you do when you have to kind of do it all on your own mm -hmm. at a small liberal arts institution. Yeah. I can go next. Um, I would say that I am newer, so I have only been a part of a couple of different searches so far and not as like a primary committee member of kind of watching our process. We have a larger school of psychology and then we also have our undergraduate department, so um, affiliated with the search process. Um, but thinking back to my own process of some things that I know were very core in the decision making process before I was um, offered the position. Um, a lot of it has to do with research trajectory, the type of institution I'm at, because I 
did not come from an R1, but came from a teaching oriented institution and clinically oriented institution, and am now at a teaching oriented institution. The research trajectory and the viability of that trajectory was a lot of what was being considered. So what type of teaching experience do you have? Um, it doesn't have to be that I've been the instructor of record for multiple different classes, though that definitely is, is looked at. Um, but have you taught and have you taught well? And what are those evaluations like um, as for any other class? Um, looking at the evaluations that um, students have given feedback for. But a lot of that had to do with, with trajectory as opposed to what has your past experience been. So I do look at the publications that I had before I was hired. Um, and I do look at then what does that seem to say about the setup for where you're going. Um, generally speaking, though, a lot of my work uh, in terms of my own perspective of preparing for this position had to do with networking. A lot of me putting myself in other positions because I wasn't coming from a place that had this, these are my research networks, right? Or um, these are the teaching experiences that I've had because I'm not coming from a place that has lots of graduate students um, teaching courses because of the type of institution I attended for grad school. Um, so then a lot of that was me at conferences um, or returning to spaces that I was familiar with and me dropping, um, dropping hints or usually being really clear actually, like I'm interested in teaching in a liberal arts institution um, and I will be wrapping up my clinical training with my internship or my postdoc at this time frame. And I actually did very strategically, um, yeah, say that at several different institutions when we were, I was in contact with different people. I started probably about three years before I finished, uh, for sure the second, two years before, and for sure the year before. Um, and so as I'm presenting with those who would become colleagues or as I'm back on those campuses, and I mentioned earlier that I'm at the campus that I went to as a student for undergrad, I'd return for alumni reunions and say something. Um, and I found particular people who were chairs or deans um, to talk about that, to plant that seed. Um, and I know there wasn't a straight shot. I've applied for their positions and don't always get them immediately. So I'm not saying that's what works automatically, um, but I do know that that's been a really meaningful part of that process on my end. And, and I'll just say, I think that, um, you know, everything um, Dr. Lynn said earlier about teaching in particular I think is important so um, for us it's not so much you know and I'm speaking from um, the position of having um, been on um, a few recent search uh, two recent searches in my discipline that um, we're not looking for quantity of teaching experience either so someone simply TAing a whole bunch of different courses means not much it's really more about can you demonstrate that you've actually had to be in a position where you've had to think about you know pedagogy in a real way um, how have you connected with students? Um, the teaching evaluations are incredibly important. I actually had not taught all that much in terms of quantity of teaching, but what I sought out in graduate school uh, with the support of my, my two wonderful, wonderful advisors um, who are still mentors to me to this day, um, was that we, we looked for um, kind of biggest impact kinds of teaching experiences I could have. And so um, I did something similar, but maybe not as great as what Dr. Lindner did in being the instructor of record for a practicum focused course, but I did something similar to that in terms of what we had at UCLA. Um, I was a um, TA for a lab course where there was a lot, there's a research and methods course at UCLA that um, is really intensive for the TA. Um, so um, so I, I did that as opposed to TAing a large 400 person lecture, which really, you know, doesn't really do much for you in terms of teaching experience. Um, and I wrote, um, a lot in my teaching statement about the work that I did mentoring um, all of the undergraduate research assistants I've had um, working with me on my own independent research projects mm -hmm. uh, and then how much that is so much a part of teaching. And so that was actually a really important thing for a place like Haverford where um, mentoring student research for thesis, for independent research projects, that is a very big part of what we do here. And so that was actually really uh, critical for, um, for getting the position. I would say overall, uh, I think that there might be a lot of student, a lot of people in graduate school out there who um, don't have much experience with liberal arts institutions and so there might be a very quick jump to thinking all they want to hear about is teaching and I think that that would be a real a real mistake um, you'd be doing a service to yourself um, and making yourself a less um, a less strong applicant I think really what it is is really understanding the kind of institution that you're applying to mm -hmm. and then really speaking to that that setting so for example if we get a um, a, uh, a cover letter and a package where the person only talks about teaching and they never talk about mentoring research and they don't talk about their own research agenda and their own research you know uh, you know interests and plan um, that person is not getting a second look 
Um, whereas someone who, you know, and someone who is only writing about research and doesn't talk about those other things, that person's not getting a second book either. Um, so I think really knowing um, the, the audience um, and really knowing the priorities of the institution and really tailoring towards that is incredibly important because not all um, liberal arts institutions are the same. Um, they're not, there's actually a lot, of, um, a lot of variety, I think. True. I wonder if I can just jump in to add, thinking back about kind of my journey here and thinking about the narrative that you're talking about, Dr. Wang, really does matter, like how you talk about the cohesion between the different types of research or clinical or teaching or mentorship experiences you've had. So I do think a lot of my journey involved translating the fact that I was a supervisor for three years, for instance, for a first year um, therapist. And that, that, that type of supervision experience wasn't primarily, wasn't only clinical. There was a very strong didactic portion of that. And so that first hour of every single week was always teaching a seminar style course. So being able to translate saying, I've mentored the students who are my supervisees, right? Or I've done these other kinds of things, but it's not just clinical work. I have this capacity to teach. But the TA experience isn't just general TA, but I've lectured or I've graded, you know, these types of assignments. I did realize I was a lot of translating. So it wasn't just what's on paper, but communicating how that dovetails well with the values of the institution I was applying for. So I just want to affirm that example. Great, thank you. Um, so you spoke kind of, you know, giving specific advice to graduate students and now uh, just a little bit more broadly, but what kind of research, teaching and funding record do you think are necessary to obtain a position at a small liberal arts college? I think I would echo what Dr. Wang has already said about the variety or the variation that is desired depending on the institution. I think doing your research, uh, not in terms of your own research uh, agenda, but doing your research regarding the institution where you want to work is super important. What did they say? Are there values? I think that research needs to be seen both in terms of like obviously what they put online, what's on in their actually application. Uh, application packet, but also um, when you're connecting with people, hopefully you're networking with them in person, talking to some people who already work there, doing some things like that. Um, I think it really involves getting a sense from the institution of what they say they value. So that's my, my first and primary thought. Um, I, I strongly agree with that. I recall on my job search, um, looking at all the available positions, and I knew for me that I wanted a position that left room for me to still have a research program and to engage with students in that way a lot. And so, you know, there are liberal arts positions that are, for instance, a 4-4 teaching load. Mm -hmm. um, and so the kinds of qualifications that you're gonna need for a place with a 4-4 load versus a place with a 3-3 load, even versus a place with a 2-2 load, I think are gonna be different because those teaching loads mirror um, Kind of the or or kind of communicate to you what the research expectation is going to be. Um, we definitely um, for a tenure track position would not give a second look to someone who didn't have a clear research trajectory. Um, for us, the um, kind of the record uh, that matters is what has your teaching been like, um, and do you have strong teaching evaluations. Um, uh, do you have a record of scholarly productivity and um, it, it really broadly defined? It's not like a set number of publications. Um, and is your research area practical for the resources we have here and the community mm -hmm. that we're in? Um, and can you communicate that in your materials? Um, <laughs> and then do you demonstrate in your materials a desire to be a part of a university? Um, we are considered a university, our university community. Um, and along with that, like I see a, a question in the sidebar about selling yourself um, as a candidate for a liberal arts position coming from like an R1. I think being able to clearly articulate what is it about a liberal arts position in general, but this liberal arts position in particular that is, is so important to you. Um, so I think in our cases, it's always been less about kind of specific numbers or metrics in the record as it is a sense that you are a good fit for the kind of position that we have available here. Mm -hmm. I would, I don't have much to add. I, you know, I fully, fully agree with everything that's been said. I, I think the one other thing I, I would say, um, is simply give me an analogy, I guess, in a lot of ways applying for my position mirrored the strategy that was involved in applying for internship. I remember having to be very strategic about what type of site am I applying to, and I applied to a couple different types of sites. Um, and so knowing that I adjusted cover letters to be able to not uh, 
de-emphasize certain things, but be, to be able to highlight things that actually were um, confirming that I thought I would be a good fit for certain types of areas. And I think that storytelling ability, the cohesion of the narrative that you tell, the translation process, like I mentioned a few moments ago, between what I've already done and how I think that fits with the values of your institution and how I know that also aligns with the skill sets that I bring, um, I think that part is, is super valuable. So, Great, thank you all. Um, so for those who might currently be on internship or postdoc, what would you recommend that they do at, at those stages to prepare for this type of application? I think I would start by saying, I said this a lot to those at the end of their graduate school training in clinical psych, is that what you're doing right now actually does matter. Sometimes there's like this de-emphasis of like, oh, I'm just on internship, I'm just wrapping up my work, and once it's time, you know, to officially start preparing, I will, but everything that you're doing now um, does build up, does matter for what happens later. I often use the example actually like in classrooms saying that whatever type of student you were in undergrad, you probably will be that kind of professor. So if you were super organized and super on top of things and timely to meetings, that's generally the kind of professor you'll be. Similarly, I think whatever qualities that you're carrying with you now, um, however you're thinking about your work, um, if you're networking or not, those kinds of things I think matter. So if you want to set yourself up to be someone who's well resourced, whether that's in terms of human capital of people you know, or in terms of um, grants you want to get or those kinds of things, I would take whatever downtime you have, which barely exists on internship or if you're at a really involved postdoc and to strategize, do I use half of my lunch hour to not only look for jobs, but also to think through what my philosophy of teaching actually is. So that by the time it comes down to putting the information on paper, you've been immersing yourself in your own thoughts about who you are and who you want to be and then how you want to present that. And so I think I would just, <laughs> yeah, I would say what I said a lot um, when I was first meeting with graduate students is that uh, just like figuring out, can I do my research in short increments of time or do I have to have five hours to work on my research? Can you work on your research in 30 minutes? Yes, you can. Figure out how to use the moments that you do have, though there are very, very few. I remember that working 50 hours a week. It's hard to find time, but you can, even if they're little. Um, so take advantage of that. I would agree with that. I think that um, a lot, you know, I think that especially in that, 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 that year on internship, and maybe that people are transitioning into postdoctoral positions or, you know, more temporary academic positions and still pursuing, um, a, um, you know, I guess a you know a tenure track position, um, which and I, I, mean, I think there's a lot of kind of structural pressures that are changing the landscape of higher education. I think that just needs to be said. It's not you know it's it's there are some things that just make it incredibly difficult no matter what kind of a candidate you are. Um, but I do think that um, you know time during that that internship year, which signals the end of graduate school, um, I think that you know doing some really thoughtful soul searching um, is important. I think that um, kind of we've been talking about this cohesive narrative um, about who you are what you bring to the table, what you're looking for. Um, I think that that's important. Um, I think that, you know, things like this, you know, um, getting as much information as you can from webinars and other resources, being plugged into professional networks where you've already learned a lot from folks firsthand about what kinds of career trajectories they've taken um, and, you know, what, you know, what advice they might have. I think that's all really important. I think that uh, my general advice would be to not um, think that there are very clear cut paths toward anything. I think a lot of it does depend on your understanding of yourself, what you bring, where it's feasible for you to do your best work, whether that's research or more, you know, whatever combination of that that may be. And then I think being, uh, being tailored in your approach to applications. And so for me, um, this may not be the advice you'd all get from your advisors, but um, I was always um, more selective um, in terms of how I applied to places. And I think that that actually added to my success on the, um, on the job market. Um, you know, I interviewed at a range of institutions from really teaching oriented institutions with no support for research at all and no expectations for research to um, our ones. And so um, I had the range, but I, I found um, the ones that I applied to were ones that, you know, were places that I could really flourish and where I found um, that there would be a really good fit. And so I think that that's, you know, that critical year, I think is a, it's a good time to really do a lot of that thinking work as opposed to just kind of blindly following along a path of what you think you should be doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have a ton to add, but I will say, I think the kind of the soul searching piece is important. Um, I found that in grad school, and especially oddly on internship, I loved my internship and cannot say enough good things about the experience, but I actually felt a little swept up in like the pressure to apply for a clinically oriented postdoc. 
Um, and I did apply for postdocs um, and would have gladly taken one, had some really cool options. Um, but for me, like the soul searching was, I am really built for a liberal, liberal arts teaching position. Um, I was really transparent um, with my training director and training faculty on internship about that. Um, I see, a, again, a question in the sidebar about like, how do you handle that? Um, in my application materials for internship, I think I, I said something about like, I am not entirely certain about the career path I'd like to take, um, said more eloquently than that, but I envision a career that integrates teaching, research, and practice. And my current career integrates teach, teach, teaching, research, and practice. Like, I, I wasn't telling a lie. Um, I, I just maybe wasn't telling the whole truth. But once I got to internship, I was really transparent with my training faculty about what my goals were. And then what was neat about that was that sometimes I selected opportunities, even on internship, that would prepare me for the kinds of clinical work I thought I was interested in doing, or the mm -hmm. kinds of teaching I wanted to do. So I had an opportunity actually to facilitate training on motivational interviewing. Um, and it was recorded um, to make a training video for the VA. But, but we sought that opportunity out for me because of my interest in teaching. So um, I think even in a kind of a full clinical year, there are still ways to um, to find things to do that are going to contribute meaningfully to that career goal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think being honest about that was, was really important for me, being really authentic about what was the right direction for my career. Mm -hmm. Something I might um, also jump in on, um, as I'm also looking, I just magically discovered the sidebar that Dr. Lewis <laughs> was referring to. There's this thing, and so it's something that's jogging my thought about this was that, so I had a, um, a, I had a, I had a one uh, two-year-old um, during the time that I was on internship and I was also pregnant again with my second child at that point um, halfway through that year and so I think for me it's always been also a thought of um, you know what kind of a what kind of a life do I want to, to lead overall not even just job or career you know career-wise but just kind of what kind of life I, I want moving forward with um, you know, uh, yeah, you, know, in a, you know in a healthy marriage and being close to, to my family uh, my family of origin. Um, those things are really important to me. Um, mm -hmm. and I think sometimes they're not emphasized as much as they should be. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, and so for me also kind of when, you know, that, that internship year was also a time where I was thinking about what are the kinds of institutions that I think I could actually, you know, have better work-life balance. I'll mention just because there's a couple of questions on the sidebar about this. Um, my institution is really quite fantastic around, um, around parental leave. And so um, I had a full semester um, of, of paid leave each time that I was, um, you know, giving birth. Um, and then um, I had a tenure clock stoppage of one year. So it's one year total, regardless of you could have five kids, you could have, you could birth, you know, you could have five kids, adopt five kids, it doesn't matter. It's, it's mm -hmm. one year stoppage. And so I had that. I also had the complication of um, when I first started, I was only half time. I was on the tenure track. I was half time. I was half time completing a clinical postdoc mm -hmm. um, at Penn where I was getting um, hours for licensure, which was fantastic. And, you know, I negotiated something with the institution that supported that. And so that's changed my timeline a little bit, but, um, but that, that worked. The fact that, um, the fact that I, I was at an institution where other folks, in the department on interview, you know, when I was interviewing, were telling me that the, you know, the, this institution is really supportive of, of families. Uh, mm -hmm. That makes a difference. Um, and so um, that was certainly not the, you know, not the case at other places that I interviewed at or that I, um, you know, had, even had, you know, any other kinds of contact with. I mean, certainly that's not the case at all places. And so I think that that internship year was actually a really good, because I'd already started a family, was about to enlarge the size of that family. I mean, that was all really important, um, soul searching at that point too. I think I would add that I have appreciated being able to try and find out what's on paper and then what is going on with the institutional culture and to see if some of that can be more explicit when it came down to negotiating things um, for my contract. So thinking about your mention, Dr. Wing, about like, um, being part-time, for instance, you could finish your clinical work. Um, I happened to be at a postdoc the year before I started teaching that was a group private practice, and so I just didn't accrue all the clients I thought I was going to for various reasons um, in terms of build-up for clientele, and so I did have hours to finish, and I am also pre-licensed as well, like Dr. Linder stated, and so one of the things I did was to negotiate to have release time 
to do clinical work, um, but I didn't actually adjust my 3-3 program. And so that became a little bit tricky, but to know that I'm not sure if this the school is going to show any support at all, but I was able to discover that we do have a dean who also happens to be a practicing clinician, though she's an administrator um, and does her own research and scholarly agenda. And so she modeled that it is possible to be able to find a way that we can't take away any of the classes or course release time right now. What we can do is to adjust to make sure your classes are staffed or adjust to make sure you can be off campus, even though um, our faculty handbook typically says you need to be on campus five days a week because of the type of teaching institution we are. So those kinds of things, I think, was also helpful for me to know coming in um, what I wanted to say, I do want to do all three of these things. And then I see what's on paper. Is there any flexibility? I want to honor what's on paper but at the same time. Um, have this holistic set of goals. So I can add that to you to keep in mind. Great, thank you. Um, so we will go ahead then and transition with the last half hour to some of those Q&A questions that are coming in. Um, so first up, we have a question regarding work-life balance. So just can you speak to that? Some of you have started to speak to that a bit. Um, and part of that question is how much are you working on, on weekends, evenings, during the summer? Uh, so for me, that's that's changed at different points of the career, and so um, there were some really really difficult years where you know where I was you know had lots of babies, and you know there were um, um, you know lots of time, and and I actually had really um, really supportive I had really supportive um, department and really supportive institution behind all of that. Um, but I would say that um, I worked many men most evenings um, and worked a lot of hours most evenings um, and that you know that was probably the first three four years um, I still do work evenings sometimes but I also leave early from work um, a few days and so I, I really see that as more um, kind of reallocating how I work as opposed to the amount of work that I'm doing um, I really do try to save weekends for family now I'm also at a point in my career where I can do that um, before that wasn't as much the case um, summers are entire I have no teaching expectations at all of it. We, we don't have classes over the summer um, that faculty are, um, you know, there's, there's optional things that you can elect into, but there's no um, teaching expectation over the summer. So uh, summers are entirely for research. We get funding to hire research assistants um, from the institution. And so I usually have, um, you know, one or two paid research assistants, uh, perhaps some volunteer ones as well. Um, working entirely on my own research. Um, you know, I also just take it really easy over the summer, which I'm not ashamed to say at all. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so, I mean, I, th I think it depends on, again, you know, I, you're probably gonna hear different answers depending on career stage, depending on what our expectations during the summer to begin with. Um, so, uh, like Dr. Wang said, for me, I think um, the evening and weekend thing has, has varied a lot. Um, in large part, honestly, as a function of like, in the beginning of my career, I was single and now I'm not. Um, and so that for me has actually been really good because I, I probably tend to work a lot and over prepare almost. Um, and um, my significant other works a regular nine to five job and wants to like relax in the evening. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that has actually been a really healthy thing for me, to be honest. Um, I would say at the beginning of my career, especially when I had a lot of new course preps and was trying to get projects rolling, um, maybe a good thing that I was single then um, because I did work a lot over evenings and weekends then. Um, but as the number of course preps that I've had has dwindled, as I've been able to become more efficient, um, I really now take a couple evenings a week for myself. Um, I'm an active musician, actually, so I, I have always, even during those early years where I was working a lot on the weekends, maintained time for that activity. Um, I, and I work less on the weekends now. I usually will reserve Saturdays to kind of do whatever I would like to do. I do find, um, I typically like to work some like on Sunday afternoon or evening just to get oriented to my week. Um, I, that to me feels really calming, but I know other people who don't work at all over the weekend. Um, summers here vary. So um, we don't have a teaching expectation, but there are opportunities. And in particular, Stetson has increased the number of online course offerings that we have in the summer. We don't do undergraduate online courses in the regular academic year, but in summer we do. And so Several years ago, uh, actually my first summer, I designed a, an online abnormal psychology course. Um, I don't think the amount of time and energy that that took 
um, for me was like worth it in the, in the, uh, it was worth it in the long run in the sense that I will offer that course probably every semester until I die <laughs> and um, teach it if it makes and, and not teach it if it doesn't. I probably will not um, design from the ground up another online course. That um, was far more time than I expected um, and took time away from my research, which is really, you know, in the summer, that's when I get to do the deep dive on the research. Um, I finished several papers this summer. It was great. Um, the university does have some financial support for faculty who'd like to embark on a particular summer project. So I've, I have taken advantage of that twice, and that grant is actually for, for salary, not um, project costs. There's a, a separate fund that you can get money um, for project costs from. And so what's nice about that is like I actually do get paid a little bit extra if I want to write that grant to do a deep dive and work on my own research. Um, but I mean, we really, we did, there's no, no expectation that says that we have to do research over the summer or that we have to do teaching um, and definitely no expectation for service. I think um, sometimes there's a little bit of service creep and I'll get emails sometimes asking me if I can take a meeting at a particular time and unless it's something I feel really interested in, um, I simply respond that that that's something that we can do during the academic year. I really, I do not do service in the summer. Yeah, I think I am definitely still figuring out what it looks like to have those uh, different rhythms during the academic and the summer uh, terms or the academic year and then summer, which does look really different at my liberal arts institution as well. Um, in terms of summer this last year, I focused primarily on research and clinical work. Um, part of that clinical uh, work emphasis was to finish off the hours that I need for licensure. So there's a early career uh, necessity there or interest, I guess, on my end. Um, so up the number of clients I was seeing, number of sessions I was doing, and then also increase the amount of research I was doing on my own research trajectory. And then also I mentioned earlier, working with doctoral students, diving into some of what they're doing in literature there too. Um, in terms of uh, work-life balance in general, I would say that so much, um, that is driven for me by my value of balance in general. So I don't think I'm the most balanced person, but if ever I focus um, more than 40% of my time on any one thing, I'm just generally unhappy. That's part of why I'm still doing clinical work and part of why I'm at an institution where teaching and research, um, there's room for both um, because I find myself being drawn to doing a few different things at a time. That said, balance also includes having time for family. Dr. Wang mentioned the significance both of her family that she's created and also her family of origin. I don't have a family of my own that I've created, but my family of origin is very important to me. It's part of how I chose where I wanted to work, knowing that I had siblings um, and close community that lived in the area. It's part of how I, choose, um, I chose to stay in this area and even chose internship around that, um, which I haven't done much of my life. So I that that's a value of mine. I'm gonna um, let that creep back up on the priority list in terms of decision-making. Um, and what I'll choose to do and where I'll choose to be. Um, my weekends do tend to look like a lot of time with community, with people I enjoy being with, um, with my faith community as well. Faith is really important to me, so I find myself volunteering a lot I'm at my church, and a lot of hours engaging in singing and those kinds of things, um, or meetings or committees that I'm on and those types of environments. So um, I definitely feel like my life outside of my academic work is very robust and many people comment on that as well when they're around. They see me very active in other spaces. Um, that brings me life, which is a lot of why I do it. Um, yeah, so there definitely is a value for me of those multiple different hats. One thing I'd also just kind of add also is that um, I think that, you know, quantity of hours spent on something doesn't necessarily equate output or quality. And so I think that's something that I've learned, you know, over time. I worked really, really hard in graduate school. Also, you know, was married throughout graduate school, um, you know, was very active in my faith community as well. Um, and, you know, certainly had a life outside of work. I worked very, very hard and many, many, many hours, as I imagine most of us have. Um, but I think what I've also realized is that, you know, the hours spent don't necessarily necessarily mean um, they're good hours. And so I think that efficiency comes with, you know, more experience with this kind of work, um, especially if, when you're balancing multiple things, like many of us tend to balance at um, liberal arts institutions. And so, um, you know, so I guess I, I just want to say also that um, even if I'm not, you know, even if I'm working, you know, a 40 hour week, which I know sometimes people brag about working 80 hour weeks, which I think is you know, really not 
great. <laughs> but um, you know, if I work a 40 hour week, I think that I'm actually very efficient and productive with that. Um, you know, I don't think I'd be necessarily more productive if I worked a 60 hour week, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so we have a question coming in from a current postdoc uh, asking to, if you have anything else to share about how to sell yourself as a viable candidate for a liberal arts position when you are coming from an R1 institution. Um, I think from my perspective, you know, we, in our searches, often see a lot of, of those types of applications. And I think for us, we're, we're always kind of thinking to ourselves, does this person really understand what we do and how we do it? Um, and maybe sometimes there are folks who are a little skeptical of like, you know, does this person actually want this particular life. I tend to be less of that mindset probably because I, I was one of those people who, you know, on paper may not have looked like I wanted this life, but definitely did. Um, so I think anything that you can do to demonstrate that you have learned about the, the specific institution to which you're applying and feel really strongly about pursuing this career that kind of integrates teaching and research and really focuses on undergraduates rather than what an, an R1 career might look like, which is focusing largely on graduate students and securing external grants and spending much of your time on research and um, teaching almost in some ways as a bit of an aside. I think you really want to communicate that well in your application materials. Yeah, I echo everything that Dr. Linder said. I would also say that um, part of part of being um, I think thoughtful and also successful is thinking about how your research in particular is feasible at that at that institution. So if you're doing research and you you know do um, you know randomized controlled trial research, I mean that's not going to happen at a um, large institution without the resources of a medical center or of an R1 in general, right? So so it's kind of thinking about how you see your research. Uh, and there, all of us have many potential paths in our research moving forward. And so when I went on the job market and was really focusing, you know, I applied to many different institutions, but was when I was thinking about focusing on the liberal arts path, I really thought about what aspect of my research is able to thrive in um, this kind of a setting. And I think making sure that you communicate that and articulate that in a way um, that the, the search committee is looking at you and thinking, wow, this person can really, really, Really do well and thrive here. They really understand what it's like to be here. Their priorities and values, you know, the ones that they speak about, um, you know, fit in well with this institution. Um, so I think that is a big part of it in terms of um, the research I've done. I agree. <laughs> Great. Um, did, did you want to add anything else, Dr. Ford, or are you? I don't know. <laughs> Great. I just wanted to make sure. Um, so the next question has to do with as you're applying to internship, but you know that you want to end up at a liberal arts college. Um, are there any particular considerations for navigating that process? Might there be particular types of internship sites that you think better help to prepare or set you up for this kind of job? And then if you did that, how did sites respond when you articulated this as your career goal? Yes, I would say in general, I, I did go on internship knowing that I was interested in teaching in a liberal arts institution. Um, and a lot of what I did was to look for a site that mirrored the diversity of interests that I had. So I had a chance to hone some of those skills. Um, obviously, uh, if you're doing a clinical internship, you're going to be doing primarily clinical work, but they often do right talk about opportunities for didactic trainings or for supervising of other students or for mentorship or for research and the time that they allot for you to do your own research or to collaborate with other people in their research on internship. I was really careful to look for a site that would allow me to have access to those types of things. Um, and I thought, found that to be helpful, even in my uh, preparation process mentally of what do I value and how do I um, pursue that, even knowing that I'm putting aside some other things, I could pursue a different type of um, site that gives me different type of training, but I want a site that allows me to do several different things. So I have practice with this full-time work, juggling several different things um, outside of the regular grad school juggle that we're used to. Um, I found that to be really beneficial. Um, so I have always known, you know, like I said, in my, my cover letters for internship, um, I said something about wanting a career that integrated uh, teaching, research, and clinical practice. And so um, that was kind of the way I addressed it in those, in those materials. Um, 
I looked for an internship site that would give me the kind of clinical experience that mirrored the kinds of clients I felt like I would like to see um, outside, you know, like in private practice um, mm -hmm. as a faculty member later on in my career. Um, I also paid a lot of attention during the internship application process and interview process to um, what the schedule was like for interns and whether it was a 40 hour internship week or whether it was really something more like a 60 hour internship week. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that was so important to me because I was still working on my dissertation and mm -hmm. I also knew that I, so I would be doing that and applying to jobs mm -hmm. and I wanted and needed time to do both and I, and I, wanted and needed time obviously to you know honor my commitments to my internship but I did not want a site that was going to keep me there 12 hours a day um, or that that was going to be the amount of time needed to complete the work even if on paper it was mm -hmm. an eight hour day so um, I paid a lot of attention to that and that ultimately in the internship ranking process um, impacted like my one versus my two and three okay. I, I completed my internship at, um, at a VA at the West Los Angeles uh, VA Medical Center, which is a fantastic place to train. Um, and I think I actually was, um, when I applied, I applied only locally in Los Angeles because I wanted to stay put um, for the sake of my family. Um, and um, I think my thinking had been, if I don't match this time around, I'll try again next year. Uh, and, and so for me, it really was about, you know, life balance, mm -hmm. prioritizing that, um, wanting to get the best clinical training possible. Um, it, I mean, that, 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 it's just a wonderful site. Um, um, it actually, I think, had no bearing. Like where I completed internship had no bearing whatsoever on my uh, securing this position mm -hmm. or my competitiveness on, on the market. Um, you know, so I think for me, it was really all about, um, does this fit with my life um, and my life priorities? And um, does it afford me the kind of clinical training that you know, was helping develop me into being an independent practitioner? Yeah, um, the location of my internship really didn't matter. I mean, they wanted a competently trained clinical psychologist here that could have looked any number of different ways. I mean, I think some like really fancy site could have kind of um, elicited maybe a head turn from our search committee. But at the end of the day, if I had been at a really prestigious site, um, number one, I think many of the people in my department wouldn't have known um, like, was it even a prestigious site in terms of clinical <laughs> psychology? Um, but also number two, like at the end of the day, the prestige of my internship site mattered far less than can I teach? Can I have an independent research program? And am I, am I going to be a good member of this community? I think the one thing I would say, I agree with what Dr. Lenner was saying um, in many ways. The one thing I found that was helpful because I decided on my internship site based on um, access both to uh, family but also access to the types of um, teaching positions I might uh, have. Um, what was very helpful was having supervisors who also taught, and I did have several uh, supervisors who were also professors, whether that was an adjunct professor or actually full-time professors and they were teaching, um, they were doing supervision part-time actually. Um, but I, I had a chance not only to watch that being modeled and that was helpful to see that or to know about that when I was interviewing uh, for internships, but also that wound up being helpful in the networking process for me as well. I said I've actually made some connections already with some of the professors at different institutions nearby um, and so as I'm going on the market I have um, some personal and professional and clinical networks that I've kind of started to develop so that did wind up being um, something really meaningful for me. Thank you I think that addresses some of the questions that people were raising regarding internship. Um, so the next question we have is how can you get a sense of the family-friendly nature of a department? <laughs> Of a family. <laughs> um, if other folks have families and speak freely about that, I think there's also some things that are part of, um, you know, uh, what, what are the, the leave policies that support parents? Um, you know, those are kind of codified ways in which the institution signals um, what the priorities and values are. But I found that just kind of speaking with, um, speaking with, you know, so when you go on, um, you know, it might be that you know some information kind of informally through other networks already about an institution. But let's say you make it to the interview stage. Um, I mean, that's really an opportunity to kind of ask these kinds of questions. Now, of course, everyone's using different, you know, you have to use your discretion about um, how you think that will be um, received. But from 
from my perspective, I never hid the fact that I had children. Um, and so, um, you know, those were questions that I asked, you know, so what, what are, what are childcare situations like in this area? Um, how, what's your experience been, um, if someone disclosed to me that they had children, you know, what's your experience been in terms of work family balance? So I think a lot of it has to do with you kind of just asking questions and making it known that that's something that's important to you. My thinking was if someone doesn't want to hire me because of that, then I probably didn't want to be there to begin with. Um, but I think also just, you know, seeing what were the examples of other folks we've had families on campus, you know, um, Oftentimes, faculty are very happy to talk about that um, if they've had positive experiences. I would say I, I paid a lot of attention during the interview process. Um, both, I mentioned this a moment ago, to what I see and hear, both on paper and what I see and hear when I'm actually meeting with people. And so it was really helpful to me to see the number of faculty who are at different stages of family life, um, whether that was single or married with no children or married with children that were actually young, versus many people who had children once upon a, like, you know, a while ago, they're at a different stage of their career, to kind of get a feel for the new hires in general at this institution. Um, who's coming in, who um, is having some amount of balance. And then I did ask those explicit types of questions too. As a person who's single, that was actually really intriguing to me for the type of institution I'm in. Um, a lot of people are partnered or married. And so um, paying attention to what's the culture of is the expectation that you will work harder and more or that you'll work less. Um, that does shift, especially depending on um, what region of the country you're in. I've noticed some different changes there for expectations. You're single versus uh, married especially if faith is involved as well as another layer of complication that's really interesting um, in regions. And so um, having a chance to watch that and actually knowing that marital status and family status came up in some safe ways uh, during the interview process was really important to me as well, to hear how I talked about those things and they were talked about well, which is why I pursued the option. Um, so I, I mean, I would say during my interview process, I, I didn't pay a lot of attention to how family friendly we are and that I think relates in large part to my own um, plans in that domain of my life. Um, I think um, for me a couple really important indicators though just that like the institution cares for you as whole people um, were that faculty here were very open to like asking me if I had any questions about um, like work-life balance or what those kinds of things looked like um, or fr like freely offered information about it, you know, because they can't ask you if you have kids or what your plans are. But um, on my interview, colleagues would very freely offer information like, oh, so, you know, faculty often send their kids to school here or the childcare is this. So without even knowing, they were offering that information to me. Um, I think too, on my interview, I got a really clear sense that the, the faculty and administration here care about us as whole people, not as just people who are here to do the teaching and do the research and make them all look good. Um, so, you know, people were interested in my hobbies and my interests and my goals kind of beyond the institution. Um, and we also have a ton of faculty who have been here a really, really, really long time. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a really good indicator just of a healthy culture more broadly, including a culture that will sustain families. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, how have you gone about securing, uh, searching for and securing dual appointments, such as, you know, your academic position and in a counseling center or clinic, um, or balancing building a private practice with the demands of your job? I, I can start and say it's a work in progress. I think of uh, figuring out with each season uh, what the priority is and what my emphasis will be. Um, I knew that I wanted to do both clinical practice and teaching, and so that was never negotiable to me, I guess. I was always like, I'm going to find a place that allows for both, and, and maybe both might mean that there's a dip in my clinical work for a season, um, or there's a change or a shift that I'm open to that, and I, I need to be open to knowing that something could change that I don't expect for various reasons, especially with a tenure track position. Um, but knowing that I was interested in that, um, meant that as I applied and as I talked to people before I applied for different institutions and as I interviewed, um, those were explicit conversations that people knew that I was interested in doing both. And I was paying attention to the culture of the school of psychology that I was applying to at different sites. Um, 
I always look and then always ask, um, are the other professors, are any of them practicing? And everyone is not a clinical psychologist, and I'm delighted to be working with cognitive psychologists and developmental psychologists and you know, social psychologists as well. But for those who are clinicians, um, is anyone who is here actually still practicing or have licenses lapsed? I've paid a lot of attention to that, and I noticed some patterns um, and was able to say to myself that everyone needs to find what works well for them. So someone who might have been trained as a clinician and then decided not to practice, that's wonderful, do what works well for you. But I know I want to do both. And so then I started asking explicitly, what does that look like here um, to be able to know that you want to do both and to maintain that? And so it just required me big, having eyes open and then asking rather explicit and direct questions. Um, and then acknowledging to myself that my, my weeks are going to look different than they do than my colleagues. So I am, I am working different types of hours and sometimes longer hours because I am practicing compared to my um, colleagues who aren't. Um, and I acknowledge that's a choice that I've made, right, and accept that that's a decision that comes with a cost of time. Uh, I have the same research expectations and the same uh, teaching expectations, but there is not a clinical expectation for faculty here in the undergrad department. I've chosen to take that on. That adds something to my teaching. I love being able to give the identified case examples and those kinds of things in my work. Um, it allows me to keep that part of my training that I have chose to pursue. Um, but it comes at a cost, and I acknowledge that, um, but it's worth it for me. So, yeah. Um, I think for me, um, in, uh, I would echo a lot of what Dr. Fort said about kind of recognizing different seasons of your career and um, times when you might be doing more clinical work or less. Um, so I came to Stetson without having done a postdoc. Um, knowing that, that there was a challenge in that because in the state of Florida you need hours for licensure uh, beyond that that you, you do during your graduate training. And so um, also recognizing that this is a teaching and research focused institution, um, I did not feel like it was um, a super appropriate for me to come in and start seeing clinical or seeing clients right off the bat. Um, I really felt like I needed to spend some time on my teaching and research, demonstrate my clear commitment here, um, make sure I was on the, the path to um, successful tenure and promotion, and then see clients. And I also um, just kind of trusted that, that the right time would be revealed to me. I didn't really have a timeline. And then, like I mentioned earlier, um, we wound up hiring a psychologist to direct our counseling center here. And that, to me, I was like, this is so serendipitous. This is the moment. Um, because I was in my fourth year um, completing a pre-tenure review that was going really well. Uh, I wasn't going to have a separate commute and also my uh, former graduate advisor is still local and was willing to provide supervision for my clinical cases. Um, the director of our counseling center didn't want a, a dual relationship with me um, and I think just has too many interns to supervise. Um, so for me, that evolved really organically. I think um, when it comes to building a private practice, again, I do have the benefit of um, having my graduate advisor around and she's got a really active practice. Um, in fact, she constantly says, I can't wait until you get licensed so I can refer people to you. Um, I also do have the benefit of having another clinical psychologist in my department who is early career. And so she and I have talked actually about in terms of just logistics like office space, um, potentially exploring that together um, to, to make it all work. Um, so that, that's been my experience. Um, as I kind of mentioned before, I had um, spent the first two years at, you know, partially first semester I was on maternity leave. And then, uh, um, and then the rest of the time I had actually spent um, 15 hours per week getting hours for licensure. Um, I was actually, I had um, course releases to do this. So it was fantastic. I got paid full salary by the college because they supported the fact that I was a clinical psychologist and I was the only clinical psychologist, still am. Was, tenure line in our department. We have visiting um, adjunct professors who are, um, you know, who are clinical psychologists, but I'm the only one who's tenure track. And so um, they wanted to support that, which was really important to me. Um, so I completed my hours the first two years and then uh, took the third year to sit for all these, you know, for, for the EPPP and, you know, all that stuff and then got licensed the following year. Did nothing with a license um, for a year after that and then decided it was time to, um, you know, I 
wanted to have any kind of, uh, you know, clinical activity that it was time. And so then I started, you know, I started out with just, you know, so, so basically I, I found um, a group practice that had a great reputation in the area, applied, it was a great fit. I'm very happy there now. I'm starting into my fourth year now there. Um, and um, it's been fantastic. I, I will also say it's it's incredibly lucrative uh, to be in private practice, and so I think that's something that um, um, you know I think I'm paid I, I think I'm paid rather well here at Haverford. Quite honestly, it's um, it's actually uh, I have no complaints about that. Um, but you know it's something that it, it's nice to to feel like you still are a practicing clinician, and um, the remuneration for that is not a bad thing either. That's true. Wonderful. So um, thank you all so much. We are just about at time, so we are going to have to wrap up there. Uh, but thank you, uh, Dr. Wang, Dr. Fort, and Dr. Lindner for all of your insights and, and expertise in this area. I think hopefully it's provided people with a, a lot of additional information about pursuing this route.